thank you so much for this nice introduction, for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's really a privilege to speak in this seminar. And I also want to thank everyone attending. Uh, I see in this list some of my friends, uh, my colleagues, uh, and many very established mathematicians. So thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I will be talking about uh, counting extensions of global fields, but mostly uh, of not of the rational numbers and the rational function fields. So let's start with just the rational numbers. I'll fix some notation, which I'll use. Uh, G will be some finite group I'm working with. Uh, for the sake of concreteness uh, and without losing much, it's already great to think about the case G equals S3, the group of permutations on three letters. Uh, as, as an example, uh, much of what will be said is already of content in this case. And the, the thing I'm really interested in is the collection of all uh, G extensions, uh, so to speak, of the rational numbers. So I'm, to be precise, I'm, I'm looking at the family of pairs of an extension, which is Galois over the rational numbers and uh, an isomorphism from the Galois group of this extension over the rational numbers to the fixed group G. Uh, and in order to work with a finite family or to be able to count things, I am looking at those uh, extensions where the radical of the discriminant is bounded by a certain quantity, which I'm calling X. Uh, you can also uh, bound maybe by uh, discriminant or count by discriminant or by some other invariant as a function of the discriminant or something like this, but just for concreteness, I'm uh, setting up uh, the count uh, in this way. So this is the product of, of ramified primes that I'm counting by. And so, uh, yeah, so, uh, so the natural question in the setup is to try to count uh, the number of number fields uh, in this family. And this question is already uh, very interesting, I believe, and pretty difficult. Uh, for most groups, uh, G, unfortunately, we don't have yet uh, a very satisfactory answer. Uh, but a lot of work has been put into this problem. And although I don't really have enough time to survey, I'll maybe mention the, the works of uh, Vargava that treat the case where G is S4 or S5. Uh, but there have, has really been a lot of uh, work on many different groups uh, resolving this, this problem very definitively in some cases. Uh, and for some groups, this is still a uh, work in progress. In particular, there are conjectures of Mahle uh, that are valid for basically any group uh, G, but these conjectures are um, in a way far from uh, being established. So, so even though this problem is in a way very difficult, uh, what I would like to do today is to suggest to look at an even more uh, difficult problem uh, where you want to count not all the extensions, but only those extensions uh, that are ramified at the smallest possible number of primes. Um, so. Uh, why would someone want to solve a more difficult problem, maybe if even the easier problem is not solved? Uh, some motivation maybe comes from trying to solve a sh sharpened version of uh, this counting or the inverse Galois problem. Uh, and this is also similar in some way to the problem of producing primes or maybe almost primes uh, in a certain set of integers. And so the set of integers I'm looking at here is basically the discriminant or the, the product of ramified primes uh, of, of in, in, over all these extensions. Uh, and in this set, I want to try to produce uh, primes. So if you look at the discriminant, uh, then it will be a prime power if and only if there is one ramified prime, for example. So basically it's similar to summing the von Mangel function uh, over this set in case you want to produce an ex extensions with one ramified prime. So, so can we really expect an extension ramified at one prime or should we allow more primes? So how do we know how many primes uh, can be ramified? So, so the, the primes that are ramified are the ones that divide the discriminant. So I'm trying to understand how many elements are there in this, in this product, how many 
primes are indexing this product. So I will do a simple argument in case the extension is tamely ramified. So in this case, we can just take uh, the cyclic generator for each inertia subgroup for every ramified prime, uh, a prime of the base. There's a prime number in, in prime of the base Z, Q, so a prime of Z. Uh, and when we so the, the, the inertia subgroup is cyclic because I'm assuming the extension is tame. Uh, and so this set of generators of inertia is a set of minimal, it's a set of normal generators for the group. Uh, that's because the inertia subgroups generate uh, the Galois group normally, as we know from Minkowski's theorem that there are no unramified extensions of Q. So it's some basic uh, group theory and number theory that gives us this inequality that appears on my slides that um, the number of ramified primes in an extension is always at least the minimal number of normal generators of G. So the minimal number of conjugacy classes that you need in order to generate the group G. Uh, and this argument, even though it's only in the tamely ramified case, it actually, you can extend the argument to be valid also in, for, for an arbitrary extension, basically, not necessarily tamely ramified. So, so if you are, are not a fan of tamely ramified extensions, it's just like a simplified argument, but you can also uh, argue in general and get the same statement. So for that reason, in order to simplify matters in this talk as much as possible, I will assume that my finite group G is generated by just one conjugacy class. So there is some conjugacy class in the group, which already generates uh, the group. So the minimal number of normal generators is just one. So at least in principle, you can hope to produce or try to count extensions ramified at a single prime. So that will be sort of the, the in a way, the simplest case, but it already um, has enough of the content and the special case G equals S3. Of course, we have uh, the conjugacy class of transpositions with, which generates uh, the group. Um, so, uh, so, so that's the, the special case I'm, I'm, I'm headed in. Uh, all right. Uh, so, in fact, that this this kind of problem has already been uh, studied before, uh, for quite a bit, and Boston and Markin were uh, the first to make uh, pretty strong conjectures, in particular quantitative conjectures, on uh, the behavior of the count of extensions ramified at just one prime. So here is basically. Uh, their conjecture, only that I'm elaborating this conjecture a little more to make it sort of uh, as precise uh, as possible. So what I want to believe in, the conjecture I want to put forth, is that the number of uh, extension ramified, or ext number of extensions ramified at a single prime is just basically the number of total extensions divided by a logarithm. That's be because basically we expect the number of total extensions uh, to be of size roughly x, maybe times a logarithm. That's what Mala conjectures. So if we believe that these numbers are reasonably random, we sort of expect that one over log of them will be prime numbers. Uh, I am suggesting to put a certain correction factor over here. Because, for example, if you have a set of numbers that tend to be even uh, more often than they tend to be odd, then I would sort of expect that this set contains fewer primes because uh, there is a divisibility condition, which is sort of non, maybe at, at first non obvious. And so I want to keep track of this divisibility conditions by small primes. And therefore, I'm inserting this correction factor. And the correction factor. Uh, what it seems to, to, to be from uh, usual heuristics of in analytic number theory is that you need to divide the probability of an element in your set to be divisible by the prime by the probability that a random number uh, is divisible by the, by the prime p. So that's a probability for, sorry, to not be divisible by p. So that's a probability for a random number to not be divisible by p. And that's a probability for the product of ramified primes in a random extension to be not divisible by p. So we want it to be not divisible by small primes because we want the number itself to be, to be prime. So, 
So we sort of need to take into account this uh, non-divisibility by small prime. So that's the conjecture uh, I would suggest um, as a slight refinement of the conjecture that Boston and Markin already made, which is very close to saying this. Um, and so the, the conjecture, of course, uh, because even estimating the size of the set is very difficult. So that's, that conjecture is sort of very difficult. Um, even in, in the case where G is S3, the conjecture is unknown. Um, and it is unknown, in fact, for, a, for any non-abelian group uh, you can think of. If you take abelian groups such as G equals uh, Z mod two, I think this group fits into the discussion then basically this, this conjecture boils down to the prime number theorem. You, are basically just, you basically just need to count prime numbers. Um, and so uh, maybe we should pause for a second and think about the case G equals S3, as I was suggesting. So if you just try to produce extensions ramified at a single prime, what you might do is take a cubic polynomial such as X cubed plus AX plus B and hope that the discriminant will be will be a prime number, and that basically guarantees that your extension is you get an S three extension as the splitting field of that polynomial because uh, most polynomials are irreducible. Uh, and so the discriminant of a cubic is something like a cube of one coefficient plus a square of another coefficient, and you might try to hope that this polynomial will produce primes. And we do have uh, strong results. Uh, in fact, results might look even stronger, such as the, the famous theorem of Friedlander and Ivanich, saying that x to the fourth plus y squared produces as many primes as you would expect. But the difference here that we lack uh, the multiplicative structure that uh, x to the fourth plus y squared has, because we're looking at something like x cubed plus y squared, maybe up to constant. And this lack of multiplicative structure prevents us from uh, having some arguments. So as far as I know, uh, there is no simple way to make th this polynomial x cubed plus y squared or some tweak or some small twist of it uh, to produce prime values. That seems to be a difficult problem. Even uh, the parity of the number of factors of the values of these polynomials is, is difficult to control. So we hit a pretty strong parity barrier when you try to produce prime values for such polynomials. So uh, nevertheless, there has been a lot of, or at least quite a bit of work on this conjecture and partial results exist. So for example, in the original paper and the conjecture uh, for certain nilpotent groups, some progress is made and lower bounds, uh, which are close to the truth are, are obtained. Um, uh, furthermore, there is work in the case S3, uh, a, very, uh, a very clever use of sieve methods combined with um, geometry of numbers methods uh, to get a lower bound in the case of, uh, of S3, but not for ramification at a single prime, but a ramification at at most uh, three primes. In particular, such a result does not tell you what is the parity of the number of ramified primes. So the parity barrier is not bypassed in this work uh, in a way because of the limitation of the sieve method. Uh, also uh, another work uh, by Barga Weingott that uh, in the case of S4 obtains an upper bound, no lower bound, but at least an upper bound, which is off by a small factor uh, for, for, for this count. Um, and again, if the parity barrier could be breached, uh, if we could say something about the parity of the number of ramified primes, uh, the upper bound could be improved the constant could be improved. All right. So because this conjecture is sort of pretty difficult, it makes sense to also just ask about existence, even if we're not trying to count. So this is a quantitative conjecture, but you might also ask about a qualitative form where you just want to show that maybe there are infinitely many such extensions or even that such an extension exists in the first place. Even that uh, seems to be a non-obvious thing. Uh, and there has been quite a few works on that 
uh, as well. So I will just mention a few, a few works on the subject. So the conjecture just says that there exists at least one Galois extension uh, with a Galois group G and ramified at just a single prime. So that's basically the conjecture. Now we're not counting anything, just asking for the existence. And so in the original paper, this was verified for all finite groups of order at most 32. Uh, this is even for those groups that are not uh, generated normally by a, single by a single element or generated by a single conjugacy class. So it's more general, but uh, these cases were verified. There has been a lot of progress for uh, solvable groups. I unfortunately cannot summarize all the progress because there has been quite a few papers. So I'm just uh, putting names of some of the authors here on the slides, uh, and I can provide more references later. Um, and so uh, more work on alternating groups and symmetric groups, sometimes even controlling the exact primes that will ramify. Uh, maybe one work which I should say something, say a little more about is the work of Roberts uh, and Venkatesh. Um, so in a way, uh, in this work, they obtain heuristic results over uh, number fields, but they use uh, sort of uh, in a very refreshing way, uh, properties of Hurwitz spaces that are usually used to obtain results over function fields. So they manage to, at least heuristically, utilize properties of Herbert spaces uh, to sort of approach uh, this, this problem. Another result that I want to uh, pause and mention is the result of Lior and Tomer that uh, deals with all the symmetric uh, group. So they produce uh, SM extensions of the rational numbers, which are ramified at most at four uh, primes. So this is off from the, from the expect expectation, which is one prime. But as in the previous results, uh, sieve methods uh, are employed. And again, the difficulty of the, of the, of the parity uh, shows up. Uh, as far as I know, it doesn't seem very easy uh, to produce an SM extension for every M, which is ramified at an even number of primes or ramified at an odd number of primes. So controlling uh, the parity uh, still, uh, uh, still seems a little bit difficult. Uh, all right, so there has been uh, more and more uh, work uh, on this conjecture. In particular, uh, Schinzel's hypothesis can be used uh, to make further progress because this hypothesis tells us that certain polynomials, maybe such as a cubed plus b squared, uh, produce uh, prime values. So this conjecture can be used beneficially uh, to, 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 uh, to approach at least the existence part of the conjecture. Um, yeah, so maybe before we pass to function to function fields, I will I will pause and ask if there are any questions. Please do not hesitate to ask. Um, maybe uh, as as a good point. Hi, uh, Mark. Good to see Hi. you, Leora. Hi, good to see you. Um, I think that uh, for the SN you can uh, bridge the even or odd because. You can, uh, it's not really the conjecture about prime value of polynomial in one variable, but for polynomial in two variables. And then you have the works of uh, Green Tau and Ziegler that gives you the correct number of primes, at least if it's linear, which you can produce that the polynomial will be linear. Okay, so I don't know how to do this. And if you know, uh, we, can, we, can, we can explain this to me later. So I'm happy that there is, there is a way to to approach the parity barrier in the yeah, but I don't I don't see immediately. So we, you can explain to me later how this that's works. Yeah that's, yeah, that's a good. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. More uh, more suggestions or questions. 
All right, so we go to, we will look at the analog over uh, function fields and we will replace the rational numbers by a rational function field over a finite field FQ. And a lot of what we said translates uh, basically word for word. Uh, so we'll just uh, to fix ideas, I'll take a prime number not dividing the order of this group and I'll work in characteristic co-prime to the, so I'll work in the characteristic not dividing the order of the group. It doesn't, you don't have to do this. It's just a little easier to do it, to, uh, to ask for this first. So I'll go for this easier problem first. But of course you can also study the harder case where P divides the order of the group. Um, uh, in particular, uh, there have been a few papers um, that uh, put forth analogous conjectures over function fields to the ones I discussed over number fields. And in fact, these papers do not assume that P uh, does not divide the order of the group. They work in complete uh, generality. It's just that, that for the results I want to discuss later and the methods, I'm assuming that P does not divide the order, the order of the group. But these uh, conjectures made in these papers and also the results obtained in the paper of Lior and Alexei and Arno do not really make this assumption and make further progress over function fields on the existence uh, part of the conjecture. So they produce, for example, SM extensions of FQT ramified at a single prime, almost always basically for every uh, Q and M with some small restrictions, which uh, I would not get into here. So, so they make a lot of progress on the existence parts of, part of the conjecture in this case, even, even when the prime divides the order of the group. Um, but so to be back to our quantitative conjecture, just to sort of uh, fix notation, now I, I'm still looking at extensions of FQT, which are Galois. I'm throwing in the extra condition that the extension be regular um, because I don't want to look at constant field extensions. This is not something which has an analog over number fields. So I'm sort of removing this, this problem at the outset. And I impose the condition that the product of ramified primes is for certain size. Now I measure size by degree of a polynomial. So if you prefer the geometric perspective, what I'm doing here is counting uh, branched covers of the projective line by uh, smooth projective curves. And I'm bounding the size of the ramification locus of the branch locus. I'm looking at covers where the branch locus consists of n points, geometric branch locus, so to speak. And again, I'm asking the same question. I want to understand the asymptotic of the number of extensions uh, that are ramified at a single prime of FQT. So, uh, so this, I want this product basically to be just one irreducible polynomial. So I just want this, it will be only a single prime that divides the discriminant. Or in other words, as I said before, I want the discriminant to be a prime power or to have a positive value of the von Mangel function, non-zero value of von Mangel. So, so the analog, uh, when you translate to function fields is extremely similar, at least as far as the statement of the problem goes. Um, but um, when we assume that the prime, oh wait, yeah, I, it's interesting how I can't use the bullet points. So somehow this, the whole slide just appears. I don't know, there's a certain, there's a certain bug on my side. But so, um, uh, so over function fields, we can uh, employ a geometric approach to counting G extensions. Uh, and we can use the growth and Klefschitz trace formula. So that's what I'll try to explain next. Uh, basically what I want to do in, this, uh, in the remaining time I have in this talk is to, to sketch a strategy of solving uh, this problem, given that we already know how to count G extensions with some room to spare, with some savings, so to speak. So the assumptions will be that we already know how to count G extensions, and this is the case for S3 or for some other groups. And I will try, given that, uh, to approach the problem of counting G extensions ramified at a single prime. That's what I want to do. And I want to use uh, ge geometric techniques, uh, among other things, to sort of approach this problem. And I believe that, for example, in case G equals S3, this will lead to a complete solution of the problem over function fields. 
All right, so I need some geometry and I'll set up the notation for that. I will use configuration space. It's a moduli space of uh, square free uh, monic polynomials of a given degree. And if you view that from the perspective of the roots, it's just the moduli space of n uh, different points on, on the line, basically. Um, they, these are the roots of the polynomial where we don't care about the order of the points. And so the fundamental group of the complex points of this configuration space is the, the, the brave group. And I'm giving a presentation here for the brave group. And so what somehow, what is the, the, the whole basically thing that gets the geometric approach going is the fact that we have a local system on configuration space uh, with the property that the trace of Frobenius at a certain polynomial on this local system is exactly the number of extensions with that polynomial basically being the ramification lock, was being the product of ramified primes, or the zeros of that polynomial being the branch locus. So somehow th this third bullet here is the somehow heart of the matter, and it is proven using um, the theory of uh, Hurwitz spaces. Uh, so using such a thing, we can try to use the growth in the trace formula to get a, uh, a handle on the count in terms of the topology, the cohomology of certain spaces. So to be more precise, I will say that this local system, when we view it as a vector space, it is just the set of all possible linear combinations of n tuples from the group uh, that generates the group, that generate the group. So basically we take all n tuples because anyway, most of them will, will generate the group. And I'm writing here down a formula for the action of the break group. Uh, so what the i generator does, it just swaps uh, the i and the i plus first elements in the tuple and then conjugates the i the ith element by the i plus first. So it's a very simple expression for the action of the break group. You can check that the relations are satisfied. So this is really an action. And uh, at least geometrically, this local system is, of course, pinned down by the action of the break group uh, because a local system is basically the same thing as a representation of the fundamental group. And when we're talking about traces of Frobenius, it's with respect to this representation. Frobenius elements, they lie in the fundamental group. And you can use the representation to compute the trace and get the number you want. So this is somehow the first step in many uh, proofs of, of results over function fields in analytic number theory, where you use the shift of function dictionary to translate your counting problem or your summation problem into a problem about sheaves, or expressed on the level of sheaves. So that's how you uh, what you can say about the problem of counting uh, extensions. And now you will want also to talk about the other uh, part of the problem, uh, which is the primes. So how do you approach the primes? So I was trying to sell this idea that the difficulty lies in the parity problem in the value of the Mobius function. And so I'm introducing here this Mobius function. Uh, and I want to explain how to use the Mobius function to get the results uh, about the prime. So this is just first the definition uh, of the Mobius function, which is basically uh, controlling the parity of the number of factors of a polynomial. Here I'm only working with square free polynomials. So it's minus one if there is an odd number of prime factors and one if there is an even number of prime factors. And there is a pretty uh, simple and well-known identity which relates the von Mangel function, or in this case, the indicator function of the primes, the irreducible polynomials, to the Mobius function. This comes from the fact that the convolution of the von Mangel function and the trivial function one is basically logarithm or the degree in this case of polynomials. And so you use Mobius inversion basically and you get the formula that I have here uh, on the slides for primes in terms of uh, Mobius. And this breaks your problem of counting primes into many smaller problems indexed by this integer k. You get different ranges of summation. And in the different ranges of summation, you can apply different techniques. So for example, when k is uh, close to n, or for example, even if k is just equal to n, you just get a constant function 1 over n here. 
And so you're reduced to the previous problem of just counting G extensions without any further restriction. And I'm assuming that this problem is already resolved as it is uh, in some cases. And so uh, for larger values of K, I can sort of already assume that the asymptotic for these sums, when you hit them against uh, counting G extensions uh, is, is already known. So, and this known sums will produce the main terms for the problem. And so the conjecture that I put forth a few slides ago on with a precise form for the, for the main term for the asymptotic will be a consequence of, or will come out of the values of K here that are close to M. They will control the, uh, the main term. And so the whole problem then boils down to what you can do with the smaller values of k. For these values of k, we want to use the oscillation of the Mobius function in some topological or uh, geometric form in order to get cancellation and uh, just so to put everything else in the error term. So, so the contribution from values of k which are smaller will go to the error term. And that way we're, we hope that the error term will be smaller than the main term. And then we will get this um, asymptotic that I was uh, hoping to get uh, a few slides ago. All right. So uh, now let's sort of geometrize this approach. So, so, so for everything on this slide was sort of uh, combinatorial or maybe just the representation group, the representation theory of the symmetric group hides behind it. But on this slide, I want to sort of geometrize this or interpret this in, a, in maybe a more topological language. So to do this, I will use the ordered configuration space, which is an SN cover of configuration space. Uh, this, this ordered configuration space is basically just um, the collection of all possible roots that, that your polynomial has. So all the roots of the polynomial with the ordering. And when you forget the ordering, when you pass from the roots to the polynomial, you get an SN cover because SN acts on the roots by permutations. And the roots are distinct. That's, that's what I'm assuming. And because you have this SN cover, it means that every representation of SN will give you a local system on configuration space. Uh, another cover of configuration space that I will need in order to interpret uh, the formula is the intermediate cover between uh, ordered configuration space and unordered configuration space is the colored configuration space. So this is the configuration space of K, let's say blue points and N minus K red points. All the points should be distinct. There is no overlap between the points. And you just take the points together to get a cover into configuration space of N points. So if you want to talk polynomials, you would say that this is the space of a degree K uh, square free polynomial, which is monic, and a degree N minus K polynomial, which is square free and monic and the polynomials are co-prime. They don't have roots in common. And this map is multiplication of polynomials. So that's what happens on the level of polynomials. So we have this, this cover on the level of polynomials as well. And then I can again, reinterpret the formulas from the previous slide using the function shift dictionary in the language of trace functions. So that's, this is what this equality is doing. So the, the indicator function of the primes of the irreducible polynomials is basically just this function. That's just rewriting what I had on the previous slide, just in a slightly different language. And now I'm using the fact that uh, the Mobius of a polynomial is basically the exact same thing as the sign of the permutation of Frobenius acting on the roots of this polynomial up to minus one to the degree of that polynomial. So this allows me to interpret the formula in terms of representation theory and then rewrite everything in this sheaf theoretic uh, language. So eventually everything I want to count or everything I want to 
Some can be written in terms of trace functions of Frobenius elements and fundamental groups on certain uh, local, local systems. And that's somehow the, the, what's happening in this step of the argument, which is the function sheaf dictionary. And so now let's try to put everything together. So what we want to do is basically uh, sort of clash the two things, to make the two functions correlate. So on the one hand, we have the function that's coming from the, in, from the indicator function of the primes. And on the other hand, we have the function that comes from counting uh, G extensions. And we need to multiply them together to get the correlation because we want the indicator function of the primes times the number of G covers with that uh, discriminant locus. So here I've already separated the contribution of each K to the problem. And now you use a basic fact that the, the trace uh, of a tensor product of two matrices is the product of the traces. And you have eventually expressed the problem you wanted to solve as a sum of a certain trace function over the points over the F P is supposed to be FQ, I guess, but I'm using FP uh, over the FQ points of some algebraic variety over FQ. And that's somehow the point of the whole translation and all the notation. And so once this translation is done, I can apply the growth and equal Lefschetz trace formula to re-express the thing I want to control in terms of cohomology, or more precisely the trace of the action of Frobenius uh, on cohomology. Uh, that's what I'm doing in this step. And once I did that, I will use several tools to control the sum. So because I want to get cancellation, I just need to bound the sum. I don't need to ex ex extract any main terms anymore. And I will sort of use the crudest possible bound. I will not try to get any cancellation. I will just try uh, to take the absolute value of the sums of the eigenvalues of Frobenius or just take the largest possible eigenvalue of Frobenius and multiply it by the number of eigenvalues. So it's the somehow the, the, the most naive approach to trying to bound the sum. And in order to execute the argument, I need to know a couple of things. First, how large are the eigenvalues? And second, how many eigenvalues are there? What's the dimension of the space? So for controlling the size of the eigenvalues, I have the very strong result by Deleen, the Riemann hypothesis, which gives me somehow the strongest possible upper bound in many cases on the eigenvalues of Frobenius. And this upper bound is Q to the I over two if you work with cohomology in dimension I. So I'm using this result and I'm using a bound on the dimension of each cohomology group, uh, which arises from the Solvedi complex. So, uh, the idea of the Solvedi complex is basically uh, to construct a certain complex. This is the Solvedi complex, a certain, a certain finite CW complex whose homotopy type is the same as that of configuration space. And therefore, you can compute uh, cohomology from that uh, complex. So this CW complex eventually gives you a complex of abelian groups whose cohomology you need to compute. And you have very strong a priori or very naive, I would say, a priori bounds uh, on the dimensions of the groups and the complex, even before you take cohomology. So if you look at the, the way the Silvetti complex works, you will see that the, the cohomology groups or even the groups themselves in the complex are as large as the dimension of the local system, uh, basically, times a, a certain uh, polynomial. Uh, but, but basically, because the dimension of the local system is exponential in, in n at worst, when k is close to n over two, um, uh, we get an exponential in n bound on the dimension of any cohomology group, or even on their sum, uh, as a result. And so, this sort of uh, very crude argument. Uh, allows you to treat a whole range of cohomology groups 
the range that this treats is, I think, where i goes from, uh, so it goes from zero, I think, up to a little over the middle, which is m. Uh, but there is still a very large range where this argument doesn't apply. And because it doesn't apply, we have to show that cohomology in a certain range vanishes so that we don't get an extra contribution. So in the range where this will fail, we will have to uh, prove a result uh, on vanishing of cohomology. And this is what my uh, last uh, slide is about. So our uh, idea here is to use uh, the methods of uh, Ellenberg, Venkatesh, and Westerland to show that the cohomology uh, which the previous arguments cannot control uh, will vanish. So uh, what, what is the range that we needed to vanish? So uh, I'm writing here alpha and beta for some parameters. Beta will be a little over a half and alpha will be close to one. So there is a range of cohomology or if you want to use Poincaré duality homology where everything will have to vanish in order for the argument uh, to work, in order for us to get enough savings for the whole argument to go through. Uh, and somehow, uh, as in the paper of Ellenberg, Venkatesh, and Westerland, what we want to do, how we want to prove that homology vanishes is first by showing that the homology is stable. So we want, so somehow the, the theme of the argument will be stability in homology. Uh, and how this is done is by observing that the module M here, or the abelian group M, is a module over the ring of connected components, so to speak. So, so basically, in order to get the argument going, you need to first uh, study the case I equals zero. So if you plug just I equals zero, you get a certain thing here. That's what I wrote. And you can show that this one has a ring structure and that th this abelian group M is a module over that ring. And so where does the structure uh, come from? You, one way to see it is interpret this homology as group homology for certain braid groups, such as the ones I had on previous slides. And then if you have braid group on K strands and a braid group on M strands, you can juxtapose the strands and get an element in the braid group of K plus M strands. And this juxtaposition is compatible with certain very natural maps. So th these maps are also juxtaposition or, or concatenation maps on these local systems. Uh, and this gives you all sorts of maps between pairs of homology groups. And these maps give rise to this ring and module structures. And so multiplication by elements uh, from R uh, gives you certain maps, which we hope to show are stabilizing maps from the homo for the homology. So stable homology will be proven as a consequence of showing that a certain map of multiplication by an element from R is an isomorphism basically on M. Uh, at least for, for large enough degrees. Uh, and the way this is shown that multiplication by elements from R gives stability in homology is by studying an arc complex uh, similar to the one uh, studied in this work of Ellenberg, Venkatesh, and Westerland. So this arc complex uh, is a certain simplicial complex, which is highly connected, it's n minus two connected, and it admits an action of the braid group with control behavior on simplices. And so this action can be used to produce spectral sequences uh, as in this uh, paper of Ellenberg, Vegetation, and Westerland, which allows you to get some control on the cohomology and eventually prove stability. And so to, in order to, for this argument to run, uh, what we need at the end of the day uh, is a control on this ring R. We have to understand the structure of this non-commutative uh, ring R. Uh, basically understand uh, the dimensions of these abelian groups. And as is often the case, uh, what a study of H naught 
is related to is the large finite field analog of the problems we were discussing earlier in the talk. So instead of fixing a Q and letting the degree go to infinity, you might as well fix the degree and let Q go to infinity. It's a very different sort of problem, which does not admit an obvious analog over the integers. And what this problem boils down to is precisely the understanding of this H naught. And uh, in a recent preprint, which I will not unfortunately have enough time to say much about, um, this H naught is studied and it is shown that it basically uh, vanishes for all n large enough. So it is shown that this homology group vanishes as soon as n is large enough in terms of the, of the group uh, G and this extra parameter alpha, which is pretty close to one, but is a little smaller than one. So this ring ha happens to be very small, just, just finite dimensional, because most of the terms here are going to vanish. And this will uh, sort of uh, allow us to show that the stability maps are basically zero. And if the stability maps are zero, uh, stability basically implies that this module has to vanish. So that's about all I wanted to say today. Uh, I hope I didn't go over time and I thank everyone for, for the attention. And I'm eager to know if there are further questions because uh, most people were pretty silent during the talk. So I'm happy to hear if anyone has a thought or a comment to make.